because of the change in the location of the loader valve which this is clearly a better location but what it means is that I bought the wrong hoses these long hoses were originally intended to loop the loader valve was going to be here and then these hoses would make their way down and up here and there would be quick disconnects in this vicinity and so I needed those long hoses to do that at this point come time to actually install this valve and hook up the cylinders I realized that what I really needed is just four short hoses to jump from here to hard lines located give or take right there and then the hard lines would make their way over and to here I found myself with these extra big long hoses and decided to go this route and it certainly is perfectly functional having said all that this is ugly I mean you know all these big goofy hoses and all this big rat's nest of stuff and it's just waiting to snag on stuff and get caught up and just looks terrible so what I'm gonna do about that is I'm going to build a cover that's gonna go here that's going to protect some of this menagerie of hoses and dress it up a little bit so for a cover to conceal all those hoses I looked, I was going to use this steel channel, which is the last of the channel that I have. But when I picked it up and realized just how heavy it is, you know, I thought it was kind of silly to add another 50 or 60 pounds of steel, essentially just to act as a cover. So I didn't want to go that route. So I have this two inch aluminum uh, angle iron, and I have just built it into a single member by riveting in an aluminum sheet to join these two pieces and then I will rivet in an aluminum front cover like so so then putting it in place I realize I have to have hoses pass through here and I have to have hoses pass through here so these I've carved this little bit of a channel that the hose will be passing through in this orientation to that effect I took the uh, Dremel with a carbide bit in it and very carefully uh, you know rounded over any of these edges that could conceivably rub on the hose in the in the direction that it's going and then we'll get this all bolted in place and painted to match I drilled and tapped into here to screw that in behind here are the rivet nuts you know where I drilled through here and then put in the rivet nut and clamped it in place and those will last a long time and then drilled and tapped here for this quarter 20. This is all very carefully deburred and, and rounded over. The hoses don't have a lot of pressure against it. They're just kind of resting. But you want to make sure you're not putting those hoses up against any kind of a sharp edge. And as you can see, I cleaned up the routing a little bit. Just made it a little bit neater. And used this black PVC that I split longitudinally. And then... Underneath here, I welded a couple thin straps on the top here. Just enough where the clamp can get under it. So now the PVC is clamped to the strap. The strap is welded to the top of the arm. So that will hold still. So that cleaned that up and give that a coat of paint. And that's much better. By the way, let's talk about painting for a second. I could get out a bunch of masking tape and I could disassemble everything and do all kinds of stuff to paint this. Or I can do stuff like slip a piece of printer paper. I can't do it, I'm holding the camera with one hand, but you get the idea. Roll that little piece of printer paper around that hose, stuff it down in that hole, and paint away. Pull the printer paper out after a few seconds, you have a nice clean hose, you have a nice clean thing. It's not body shop perfect, but well, this is a tractor, after all. Anyway, there it is. Final look. While we're at it, another couple things I dressed up is... This is the pressure line coming up from the Power Beyond port. Uh, it was already supported underneath by this U-bolt, right? So it can't go down and it can't go left and right. But this part relatively could flop around. 
but now it's tied off onto this support so now that's rock solid this one was always uh, this is the return line goes into the the pipe based manifold that's going to go through the hydraulic filter and then the cooler and all that and this was always a little tenuous because basically I was asking the aluminum fitting of the filter to support the weight of the manifold and support the weight of this pipe that's not good so you can just see here I took this steel strip that can be bolted in place and I made a clamp out of this half inch plate just drilled a hole the same size as this and then split it in half and then you know drilled and tapped for two bolts going in this way so this piece now clamps very tight there so this is clamped tight around the pipe and then took a uh, a big 3 16 rod and tacked that and then burned this in real nice so I've got a nice thick metal flange joining this to here this thing is solid against the you know the uh, structure of the tractor so now the pipe is no longer hanging off of the filter housing up inside there this pipe is now hanging off of this bracket shot a little black paint on the pipes just because they were going to rust and look terrible here this needs to be painted uh, this is all zinc coated you know here zinc coated that is just raw steel that's gonna look terrible so in a few minutes I will wrap a little printer paper here and there and take some silver paint and shoot that with some silver paint just to keep that from looking terrible long term. So I will get those tubes painted and um, then it will finally be time to move on to the bucket. So uh, I picked up this bucket off Craigslist for $100. I don't know what it's off of. I think it might be off of some kind of a uh, more like a dipper scoop from like an excavator, uh, you know, based on the way this attaches. But in any case, uh, it's it's a perfectly nice bucket, um, the correct size, and almost the correct shape. But here's the problem: I designed the quick attach around this line right here. That, with the bucket all the way lowered that the quick attach, the front face of the quick attach, if it were joined to this line, that I could, you know, curl the bucket back, uh, you know, two or three or four degrees or whatever, whatever it is. So right now, if I were to chop this off and join the front face of the quick attach right here, then this is the full curl back position in the lower position, which is about right. But if I, leave the bucket alone and join up to it and what I'll be doing is I'll be mounting the quick attach plate back here and have to fill in this big gap to put the quick attach plate parallel back here parallel with this line and that's going to be you know relatively a pain to perform but worse yet uh, the real problem is that it puts the lip of the bucket um, something like 24 inches out in front of the the lower fulcrum that the that the quick attach rotates on and so my design goal is a thousand pounds breakout strength I, I want to be able to lift a thousand pound slab if you will with the very lip of the bucket and by increasing the distance between here and here, by adding that three or four inches that that involves, it increases the torque out there that that thousand pounds is applied. And I don't think that I'll get the strength that I want. And as it sits this moment, the bucket is really bigger than it needs to be. I don't get any meaningful benefit from this extra little bit of volume, you know, occupied by this triangle but I do get a disadvantage, which is that the, the mechanics of the bucket are not right. So, like I say, I deferred this decision to later, which is to say now, of whether or not to just cut these off and attach the quick attach plate right here, or whether to modify the bucket itself. And I think you can probably tell by the way that I'm talking uh, the direction that I've decided to go. And the direction is, we're gonna modify the bucket itself. 
So this is the line we, I was discussing a second ago. What it means fundamentally is that the bucket has an extra protrusion, an extra bend right here that we really don't need. So what I want to do is I want to I want the steel to bend here and run directly flat to this point. So to make that happen is really not that terribly complicated. All we have to do, uh, first of all, you know, we have to cut these old attachment ears off completely. So I'll just go after it with a cutting torch and skim as close as I can without penetrating uh, all the way through this plate. Then I will set up a straight edge to cut off. I will probably leave, I'll leave this bend in place and probably cut off a half an inch this side of the bend so that this acts kind of as a flange. And then we'll do the same thing here. We'll leave this bend in place and cut it so that there's a flange. So you saw the basic uh, things of how I was kind of trying to skim these welds off of here as much as I could. And then these straps, you know, this, this steel here, rather than cut them off, I just cut the weld where they were joined to the old brackets. And after I've cut this out and welded it back in flat, I'll pound these around the corner and then weld right there so that this strap, you know, goes around that bend and kind of you know, reinforces that strength around that corner. All right, it's now the next morning, and I've given it some thought overnight, and I'm gonna go with a little bit different plan. I'm going to cut here on these white lines. So I'm going to slice the middle of the protrusion that I wanna remove, and then cut here on these end lines. So after I have sliced these lines, these will now be tabs out in space. And I'm gonna put it in this shop press Put some plate steel over it and uh, just get one of the tabs going before the other one. So we'll get this tab going first, but once we get one of them to interleave under the other, then we can just press the whole thing flat across this space here. It'll save a little welding. I only have to weld about half as much. But really the key is I think it will be a stronger result. So the other thing is we're leaving these ends of the buckets full depth. And by making it that complicated shape, that the shape that has multi-dimensions and facets, I think it will have a little more rigidity than if it's just a plain rectangle. So we'll leave these ends of the bucket at the full depth, and we'll just sink this middle part. Once this is bent, I'll have to find a piece of steel that's this length and about that height, you know, to fit in here to weld in place. So I'm going to set up using my straight edge. I just run this piece of aluminum through the table saw and I think I have a height of this face about right to where I can rest the torch on this face and drag it along the line to get you know a nice clean cut. Well I don't mind telling you that I'm pretty proud of the video work that I did earlier this morning. How I set up the camera and film myself doing this nice perfect straight line with the torch how i brought it in here and put the bucket in the electric shop press and you know kind of demonstrated just how handy the electric shop press is to you know press this steel down and make all these bends nice and clean and went through and showed myself you know, tack welding these in once the bend was complete and how I used clamps across these points across here to suck this in so that the bow in the cutting edge was taken out. And, and honestly, it was some really quality film work. Uh, but you're not going to see it. Because I do my filming on my phone. Pretty much all the videos you've seen of me are done on this phone right here. Now those of you who have guessed that I mowed my lawn today 
are above average. And those of you who guessed that I mowed my lawn and my phone fell out of my pocket, well, you're very sharp indeed. So, I haven't lost any long-term video, the things that were backed up overnight to Google Photos, but the things that I filmed this morning are not with us any longer. Wah, wah. Meanwhile, all I can do is keep on going. I began with a big plate of steel that kind of put 70% of the bend in the majority of it. And then I went through with this individual strong back and kind of bent each spot to, to the profile I wanted. You can kind of see the marks where this end of it kind of, you know, bit in. And then with it held in the desired location, I tack welded it down. Next thing to do is to clean this up. Clean all these welds off of here. And then I'll get out the quick attach adapter, cut it in half, and we'll be ready to begin mounting it onto here. All right, I just discovered that I've made a monumental mistake working on this bucket, which is that I took out this peak here, flattened that peak, and that is the wrong peak. I was supposed to flatten this peak here to make it match up to the face of the plate of the quick attach adapter. And honestly, I may have to try to just undo everything I just did and then do it again. Which is awful to, to weaken the structure of this bucket by cutting into it and then bend it real hard and then bend it back. It's ridiculous, frankly. Oh, between uh, destroying the phone and this has not been my day. Okay, so here it is. First of all, I had to cut the piece completely out uh, because it was all folded up wrong. There was no way to just split it in the middle and fold the flaps down. So I did. I cut it out with the torch. And then I was able to, I first tried heating this along this line to straighten it up. You can kind of see the evidence of where I heated it. And you know, it's 3 16 thick across that long boundary. I was not able to bend it using any kind of leverage by hand. So I was able to fit the whole thing up into the press and put a pressing plate about here and just push down on the pressing plate and fold that flap back down. Then I took the other flap, this piece here, and uh, ran it through the press. Um, you can see each mark where I brought the ram down repeatedly. I went all the way down this center seam and straightened them out. It is not straight as an arrow, but it is straight enough to, you know, be an effective tractor bucket. Once we get it properly welded in, I won't have a choice, I don't think, but to put some like quarter inch plate reinforcement. Before I might have gotten away with it, but now that it's been cut in pieces and welded back together, I won't get away with that. But it's going to look okay. It does have this has a visible seam at the back. That's not a disaster. What I've done so far, I just tack welded with my little 110 volt MIG welder. But the rest of it, I will burn in with a, a 330 seconds uh, 7014 rod with the arc welder. You just get a, a lot smoother bead, a lot deeper penetration, a lot more heat. The little junior MIG welder just doesn't produce enough heat to really do this the way I want. So what I'll do first is I'll do the upper and lower seams and then I'll go ahead and back it up to the tractor and get the uh, get the quick attach adapter welded onto it and then from there I'll go through and reinforce it and clean it all up. So now I'm working on filling in these triangles that were created when we inset this facet. <coughs> And I began by making a cardstock template. And then I used the template to transfer 
onto some 3 16 plate and I just very accurately cut it on the bandsaw. And then I've gone through and beveled and sanded away any excess paint in the areas where it will actually have to be welded. So this piece will inset right there and be welded, you know, on that boundary and then across here. Okay, so the challenge facing us now is that the back face of this bucket is not flat. With the fact that it's been cut out and welded back in and this has been run down the press and been, you know, flattened all down its edge, it is flat-ish, but it's nowhere near flat enough to engage the front of the quick attach adapter, which needs to be, you know, very flat, very planar. Um, if it is all out of whack, then it's going to be uh, twisting the bucket every time you do a load. It's going to be attempting to twist the quick attach adapter. And so we really need the interface from here to here to be relatively flat. The other deal is that this quick attach adapter is going to come in about three quarters of an inch higher than here. So when you lift this thing up and twist it back, it's not a very effective transfer of the power. We're going to be twisting on the quick attach adapter. We're going to be pushing down here, trying to bend this. And then this thin sheet metal is going to tend to buckle outward as the you know, torque is applied to twist the bucket back. So I tried to deal with all the issues at the same time. First of all, I did these heavy 4x4 four four angle iron, I ran the full distance, the length of the quick attach, up to the top of the bucket. The quick attach plate here will be you know, tied securely to this, and so this will transfer the torque from the quick attach plate all the way up to the top of the bucket, so that our, our back pull is happening way up here, and you know that can be transmitted onto these edges and lift the load without twisting and warping the bucket. Then that gives us a quarter inch standoff from this face. Um, that one I just chose to be the reference spec. I welded it straight on. And then this one, I had to work it a little bit, you know, laying this plate down. I had to work this a little bit to get it to lay flat without being twisted in reference to that one. So these two are now in plane. And then I came back and filled in these uh, more or less quarter inch spacers. This one needed slightly more than a quarter. This one needed slightly less than a quarter. So, since these four faces are now in a plane, I can now pull the tractor in and, you know, set this adapter height to where it needs to be. And then I can just weld from the adapter plate to this quarter inch deck surface. All right, and here we are at the stage of actually fitting up the bucket. Got everything slid up in here tight. So the idea is uh, that the I want the bucket to dig two inches deep with the bucket level. So I have the bucket on the floor level, and I have the tractor sitting on two three-quarter inch boards to elevate the tractor an inch and a half while the bucket stays on the floor. Now you might ask yourself, why is it only an inch and a half in the air? And the answer is, there's still a hardened cutting edge that's going to be going on the front of the bucket. And that is going to extend downward a half an inch. So the bucket is, is effectively sunk into the floor a half an inch right now. So the bucket is sunk a half an inch. The tractor is inch and a half in the air. The interface is snug and it is ready to tack weld in place. You know, all I need to do here is get it to hold in place well enough that I can back the tractor out with it attached and then very carefully detach it without messing with things and then go ahead and burn it in good and solid. Just finished running some welds. So these big angles are kind of representing the back of the bucket. Um, and then our adapter plate is tied to the angle. I welded it top and bottom 
and in the sides and you know over on these sides I could move dirt with the thing right now I could just call it done but it still has an area that I think is a little bit of a weak spot and that is this when you lift up on the bucket you know we're pulling here and we're pushing here so all the weight is cantilevered you know out here at the lip pulling this direction you know upside down right and so there is a compression uh, force right here where this part is pushed that way and this part is trying to resist it coming this way and we have this big gap here the other thing is I want to tie from this plate to that plate just like we tied at the top I want to tie at the bottom so that this adapter plate has its own independent box strength because there again this is thicker metal these are thicker metal but this is very thin that's going to be subject to twisting and um, crumpling that kind of thing uh, under extreme use etc etc uh, there again, it's not that the thing couldn't be used right now, it's that the thing could not be abused right now. And I want to make it, you know, as abuse proof as is practical. So, looking through my various pieces of steel, I have this quarter inch plate here that I think I could, you know, kind of put into that corner like that and it could do the job of spanning you know this gap so I think the thing I will do I will cut this into thirds I will decide on some kind of a piece of metal to go to span that gap and then tie tie a cross member to here and tie this piece to that so I'll go ahead and make that final adjustment and then other than the cutting edge the reinforced cutting edge, the bucket will be complete. Okay, so it's the next day, and the final thing of having the bucket ready to use, we need to be able to back drag. And when you try to back drag, it tries to uninstall the bucket from the quick catch. So what we need to do is the final stage of the quick catch, which is that we need a locking engagement pin to slide through that hole right there and that prevents the bottom of the bucket from tilting away and it prevents the bucket from coming off. Any of you who are familiar with the commonly available quick catch systems know that there's a big lever and you pull the lever and it drives a pin and all, all that stuff. To me, that seems like overkill. As often as I intend to switch these out, you know, I don't intend to be doing it five times a day, so saving a little time is not worth it. I'll spend more time building the lever than I will. So, I'm just going to go with a, a straightforward route. First of all, this is a chisel from a um, breaking hammer. And the steel is so hard that it's almost useless. Uh, it's very difficult to machine. It's very difficult to get make anything out of. But it's perfect as a locking pin right here because it won't wear out. It will be tough as nails. So we're going to use this steel as the actual pin. To drive the pin up and down, we're just going to weld a nut right there and use this big screw. I have it at a bit of an angle to get, uh, get around this obstructions. And I will just put a, I'll weld a socket head on here. And then just, all you need is a, uh, like a speed handle and just screw the thing in, screw the thing up. I will also, on the nut, I will drill it for a grease nipple so that you can grease these threads and that will help to keep moisture out and make them smooth and easy to operate so that they won't lock up on you. So, cut the bolt in half so I have that much thread for it and then cut these to an appropriate length they need to be able to pass through a one inch thick holder and then they need to be able to extend about three quarters of an inch. So I gave it a little bit of extra, uh, you know, just so I don't sell myself too short. And then this, this is going to be sitting in a nut and then there again needs to be able to extend and retract about three quarters of an inch. So I now need to weld that onto there 
in a way that this runs true with that. So we need to begin, we need to initiate the weld with this piece centered on here. And to do that, we can use this piece of angle iron uh, just as a little jig. So now with these two pieces of 16th plate uh, in here, I just super glued them in place just to make them less desirous to jump around and cause trouble. These are now, I can just drop that in there, and they should be in alignment. And if we look down that shaft longitudinally, we see about the same exposure all the way around the shaft. So I'll grab the little MIG welder and we will kind of weld that center portion and then we'll see if we can get it straight enough to finish welding. Now, as I already mentioned, this will be, you know, one end of what holds this shaft straight, right? This will be welded in place to hold the alignment of this pin. On the other end, it will protrude down through that hole in the quick attach plate. So I need a way, I need something, a keeper to hold this shaft in alignment as it pierces down through. And for that, I'm gonna take this, I have this uh, plug of one inch plate from when I made the mill head alignment system. Um, because we are tight to the rest of the mechanism of the tractor, Cutting this in half longitudinally and drilling it right there will work great. The pressure, when the bucket is trying to detach, it's going to be trying to pull the pin this way. And so the pressure will be that way. So we'll have a hole approximately here and all this meat to stop that pin from sliding that way. It won't have a lot of meat out here, but that meat doesn't matter because it actually can't go that way. We just need something to resist the pull this way. And we want a, a large, you know, bearing surface. We want to spread the force out over a lot of space. And that's where this one inch plate comes in handy. So here it is in its fully extended configuration. You know, these are locked together. This has been screwed all the way out. So it can retract whatever that distance is. So all I need to do now is measure this distance and then we'll cut this piece of one inch pipe to fill that gap. And then we will weld it in. All right, so there is the right hand, what do you call that, a, a throw bolt? A catch bolt adapter retention shaft I don't know what you call it but the right hand one is done so it has a 3 8 just a cheap throwaway 3 8 socket welded on the top and then I took this uh, it's like 7 16 rod I don't remember what it's from I at one time bent it into shape to use it as a handle for a Volvo jack but that Volvo's long gone. Anyway, so now it's a speed handle, ground to 3 8 square driver on that end, and then kind of sculpted those facets so that it's got a little bit of a wobble to it. You know, it can, it can wobble. So it doesn't have to be a perfectly straight on drive. And here they are, welded in place. I just slipped it down in there so that the shaft you know protrudes down through this hole held it in place and tacked it in and then went back and kind of stiffened it up so to remove the bucket stick your tool in there unscrew about that far unscrew about that far these are not greased yet they soon will be and then the bucket can release to lock it back down, of course, you just go the other direction. And like so. Now, then you say to yourself, what do I do with this tool? It's not ideal that you have to use a tool to get the thing out. It would be better if it was just a lever or something, but a tool it is. So while I was at it, I went ahead and made a way 
welded in these little end cups and welded in this spring. I bent this spring so that it has a, a catch lip to it. So drop your tool in there, go like so. And now your tool is stuck right there inside the bucket. It will not fall out due to vibration or whatever. It's I have one of the leaves of the spring, one of the lips of the spring is kind of bent over to where it actually has the, the shaft, you know, kind of captured. So this all needs to be painted up and cleaned up. But that is basically that for the bucket. So let's talk for a moment about changing the bucket out, switching between the bucket and the forks and whatever other implement I dream up. So I reach right down here and I pull out my speed handle. I put it in the left bolt and spin it, I don't know, six or seven times, something like that. Put it in the right bolt, spin it six or seven times. The right one is a little bit stiff at a couple points, but it's not so bad that you can't. And then we'll put the handle back where it belongs. The handle has a little slot that it rests in and then a spring that holds it. And then from there, So as you can see, you do have to get out of the seat to release the catch bolts. But from there, it's pretty incidental to release a bucket. Let's find out how difficult it is to recapture. So there we have it captured. It's hooked but not locked. So reach in here and get our tool. And lock the left. Attached. A little unscheduled rain squall means that we have come back the next morning. These are 60 pound bags. What's nice about them is that they will help me calculate what I need to calculate and they'll be the counterweight. What I'm looking for is the balance point. The point at which when I try to pick up the bucket, the bucket stays down and the back end comes up. Alright, so we'll start with 480. Brady did not have the class problem. There's 660. Let's see how that does. Well, 
Well, that's a problem. Because <laughs> that's all the concrete I bought. I need to find something else to put in there as a weight to get me up to the tipping point. Okay, so now we have the 660 pounds of concrete. 40 pounds of uh, some random concrete product that I had. 20 pounds of lime. And eight of these cast iron digging teeth. So let us see if we can find the point at which the bucket cannot be lifted straight up without a counterweight. So we can use a little bit of trigonometry to first calculate what is the tipping point, the loading point of the front bucket that's enough to tip the rear tires up off the ground. So in the bucket we have 799 pounds of straight weight plus the 100 pound equivalency from the conversion of the 50 pound lift. The net applied weight in the bucket then becomes 899 pounds. So at 899 pounds in the bucket, the weight on the rear tires is zero. So to get to a status where we can lift 1,000 pounds in the bucket and have 500 pounds of down pressure at the rear tires while having a 180-pound operator sitting in the driver's seat, we need a certain amount of weight hanging from the three-point hitch to provide that 500 pounds of down pressure. To calculate that counterweight, we do as follows. In the bucket, we are exceeding the 899 pounds to lift the rear wheels in the air by another 101 pounds. So we have 101 additional pounds at a 36 inch distance. Offsetting that 101 pounds, there's the 180 pound operator at 44 inches, and then a negative offset of 500 pounds at 48 inches. And then added to that is the X counterweight at a 72 inch fulcrum. In order to make the calculation easy, we'll convert all of these weights to a 12 inch unit. So the 101 pounds in the bucket at 36 inches is equivalent to 303 pounds at 12 inches. The 180 pound operator is equivalent to 660 pounds at 12 inches. The 500 pound lift of the tire weight pressure is equivalent to 2000 pounds at 12 inches. And the weight of the counterweight at 72 inches will simply be multiplied by a factor of six. So that gives us our final formula. 303 equals 660 minus 2000 plus 6x. Solving for x, we get 273.83 pounds. So we need a 275 pound counterweight. Since our concrete is coming in 60 pound bags, we'll simply mix up five of them to produce a 300 pound counterweight. Here we are building up the form to use to make the concrete weight. You can see that the form walls are made of this um, MDF strips that are joined together into one logical unit. And you say to yourself, Bob, that's the wrong wood to use for that application. You should just use plywood. And you're right, plywood would be faster but it wouldn't be cheaper because this wood has one of the most important qualities of all species of wood. It was free. Found this sitting in the gore of a freeway on my way to Walmart. There were 10 or 11 
seven inch wide by eight foot long strips of this. It had been blocking the road, it had been run over a million times. It looks like it had been there for a day or two. So I loaded it up and took it home. And I don't have any other specific use for it, so let's put it to work as form boards to make our concrete counterweight. So now with the box built and ready to be filled, a little production note, I built this box bigger than I needed to. I got my calculations messed up, which is to say that I calculated a counterweight that would work for a 2,000 pound weight in the bucket, not one. So this box is bigger than it needs to be. And it just kept chewing on my mind and chewing on my mind until I finally went and revisited it and figured it out. So we're only filling this box half full. There's no reason to tear the box itself apart. But what we're gonna do is down at the bottom of the box down there, we're gonna hang some rebar. So here I've bent some rebar hooks to hang from the pipe. And then they curl around the rebar down there at the bottom to support it. And then I just hit it with a welder just to lock the things from wiggling and rotating. The actual force will be borne by the bent hooks, but this will make it hold still while I'm working and pouring the concrete. And there again, the point of this is just getting this steel to bear the load of carrying the concrete around in the air. 300 pounds, maybe this isn't that necessary, but it's certainly not gonna hurt anything. Now the ends of this steel bar have already been turned to spec to fit my three-point hitch. In my case, this is a 7 8 shaft, about 23 inches between the faces of those hubs. And after I slip the three-point ears over this, I'll drill for the keeper pin. This is acting as a, as a clamp, really, because there's going to be pressure from the concrete pushing outward, trying to push the box out past the right place on this bar. So these little vice grips and that washer will, will keep it locked in place. We're ready to pour some concrete. is shuffled well down where gravity has it pulled down and outward to the form and that there's no air pocket or a, any kind of an artificial bridge. I almost forgot to insert a vertical member for the top link to engage in. So I will weld or bolt some ears to these outer faces but just uh, save myself the trouble of having to drill it and everything. I expect it to be fairly balanced, but you know, engaging the top link is the sure way to get it just right. So it's now been 48 hours and the concrete has set up enough to take the forms off. I did not use a release agent, but it was not necessary. The board just fell clean off without the slightest difficulty. All right, so there's the counterweight. Hooked up to the pins for the first time. It's a bit of a pain to install just because you have to navigate the tractor kind of so perfectly, you know, aligned to it. But once you're there, you just kick those lift arms in place and looks like we did pretty good with the balance of it. It's sitting more or less level of its own accord. So next we put some ears on here for that to engage to so that it keeps the keeps the weight you know straight and level.
So with the completion of the counterweight, the loader itself was officially finished. Now that's not to say that the tractor is finished, because after that point I have created installed a rollover protection system, a sunshade that mounts on the rollover protection system, a custom 44 inch pallet fork attachment, and I've even gone ahead and added a third function valve and fabricated and installed a removable brush grapple to go on the bucket. If you haven't figured it out, I kind of enjoy adding to and customizing this little machine. So there's no telling what all I will think up for it. But for the purposes of this video series, the loader itself is complete. I hope you've enjoyed yourself and learned something watching how to add a loader to a garden tractor. And as always, Thanks for watching.